Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John Munsell, the host, the producer, and the creator of this program, which is called Communicating Today. We've been on Channel 10 for a long, long time, about 20-some oh, years now, and we're well past show number 600. We have a wonderful program for you tonight, and for those of you who watch us on a regular basis, and we hope there are legions of you doing that, we come on three times every week, every Wednesday evening at 8.30 in prime time, every Friday morning for you early birds when you're driving to work and you probably can't see my show because you're in your car texting or emailing or whatever. We hope you're not doing that. And every Sunday afternoon at 3.30. We have a terrific show for you tonight. I have a very special guest who's sitting alongside of me right here. Let me introduce my guest to you. Her name is E.D. Arrington, and she came up all the way from a little town called Wilson, North Carolina on the Amtrak to be with us on our show tonight on Communicating Today. And Edie, thank you so much for coming all the way up to our program. Thank you, John, for having me on such a wonderful show. We're going to be talking about this great new book that you just wrote. And it has a title. It's called Stay the Course. We're going to be putting the cover of it. This is the cover of it up on your TV screen periodically during the course of our 30-minute show. But I just wanted to show you the cover up front. It's called, again, Stay the Course by my guest, E.D. Arrington. And this was a terrific book, E.D. I Thank read this you. book in a couple of days. 28 chapters and 200 pages of pure, uh, wonderful, wonderful sympathy and uh, feelings and uh, so forth and so on. But I guess we ought to find out a little bit more about you before we talk about the book. And I know that uh, originally you're from North Carolina. And you came up here to the Washington, D.C. area, went to school up here. Where did you go to school up here in this area? I went to school at T.C. Williams High School. Okay. And, and I graduated from T.C. Williams High School. From there, I went on to uh, my, actually, a job that I began and ended with, the National Education Association. I was there for 25 years. And, and while I was there, I, at I attended various colleges. And it completed three years of uh, formal uh, formal education. Three years didn't quite get to the fourth. Run, but didn't they... quite get to the fourth, but I tell you, it was one tremendous learning experience year after year after year. Now, I can imagine it was, but 25 years and then you retired from the NEA, uh, the acronym. Ladies and gentlemen, we use nothing but acronyms here in the Washington, D.C. area. DOD, NEA, National Educational Association. That's correct. And uh, so that's a bunch of teachers, I guess, right? And it was probably one of my, uh, one of my best learning experiences because uh, within the National Education Association, I was uh, surrounded by some of the best teachers I will ever have. Hmm. And they taught me and, uh, and had the patience of Job. Yeah. And I know that uh, in your family uh, tradition and your family bringing up in North Carolina, you uh, had a wonderful grandma down there, and she had a nickname. I guess they called her Ma. Uh, she's a very important uh, character in this book that we're talking about, folks. Uh, grandma Ma, and she was a big proponent of education. Yes. She said education is, is tantamount to freedom. Education is freedom. Is freedom. And one of the things that I can remember about my grandmother is that looking into her eyes whenever a young a child graduated from high school. And it was something that no one in her family had ever done. And you could just see her whole face light up. And that's what she wanted because to, she wanted for one of her own to walk across that stage with that diploma because the day you got that diploma was the day you were free because freedom to her was when you had choices yeah. and education gave you choices. This book, ladies and gentlemen, I read it in a couple of days. I could not put the book down, E.D. You're a magnificent writer. Thank you. This book is very sensitive. It appeals to the emotions. And of all the guests, of uh, uh, book authors that we've had on our program, Communicating Today, E.D., very rarely did I ever find that I had a tear 
in my eye when I read somebody, one some author's book. But I must confess, reading your book, Stay the Course is the name of the book, that a tear came to my eye occasionally because it was so sentimental. And I just think you're a magnificent writer, and I congratulate you, and I hope you sell a million of them because, folks, you've got to get this book. It's fantastic. But how did you get started in writing in the first place? Where did that begin? Short story, long story. <laughs> I was always very athletic, very healthy at the age of 39, almost on a dime, went through a very strange illness, couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, the doctors sent me home the way they used to say in, in church, when the, when the doctors can't help you, you call out to your God. Well, I was sent home, and because the doctors said, there's nothing else we can do for you. For five years, I was closeted in my home. And I'm type A. Type A people have to do something. And the only thing I could do was write to my daughter. And I began to write to my daughter everything I would put in writing about my life. Kind of like a diary. Everything from the, time I, from, the, from the time I was five years old, I began to tell her about my life because I was adopted by my grandparents and I knew very little about my parents. So I wanted to tell my daughter everything I could about me and about her father so that she would have as many questions as I did. Hmm. What I realized through that illness, through writing, I, I didn't feel sick because it transported me to another place. And once I finished writing all I would, could about myself, um, I started to make up stories. But in 2004, the first version, this is the second edition, the first edition of Stay the Course came right out of what I had written about my life. And then- To your daughter. To my daughter. Yeah. And uh, changing some things around. And then this second edition uh, is just polished, yeah. a little more polished. So you got the idea of writing this book that we're reviewing tonight on our program, entitled again, Stay the Course, is the title of the book, folks. Uh, from, it came kind of from the, uh, the diary that you were writing, or the, the, your life's story mm -hmm. and about your family, so your daughter would know all about the history of your family and where you came from and what was going on in your life yes. and your family's life and so forth. And out of that came this wonderful book that I just, can't stop raving enough about because it was so terrific, folks. I love this book. And I didn't bring a handkerchief along tonight because now just talking about it makes me feel kind of sentimental. But then you have a title, and then the title of the book again, Stay the Course, where'd that come from? That comes right out of my grandmother's spirit. Yeah. Whenever we went through difficulties, and this book is set in the 60s and 70s when, when times were tough, I know, that, I know that in the 21st century, people think times are tough. But in the 60s and 70s, uh, living and growing up in rural North Carolina, working in the fields, uh, times were tough. And my grand, I saw my, grand, my grandmother would sometimes send me to school so that I wouldn't miss school and mm -hmm. work the fields in my place. Wow. So my grand, so, and we had many, many deaths. And I, you know, I could just go on with the deaths. Her, her, her brothers, my brothers. It just, it just so many deaths. And she never would allow us to sit in our grief. She would say, move forward. Yeah. You, can't, you, can't, you can't sit around and grieve. You've got to move forward. And out of that, she would say, you've got, you got to stay the course. Yeah. You can't give up. And she would remind me. You can do anything you want to do yeah. as long as you would put this big if you're willing to work for it. Work and strive and try as hard as you can. Don't give up. Don't quit. Quitting is you not an option. You can be a option. winner. Uh, quitting is not an option. Not an option. And she came up with that little phrase of stay the course stay and the hang course. in there. And stay that's the, the title of your book. Stay the course. 
Now, I have a feeling, and uh, you and I were talking to E.D. As we, as we arranged to set up this show, this program tonight with you coming up from North Carolina, that this, in fact, is kind of an autobiography of you, <laughs> of your life. You use some fictional names, you use some fictional characters, but this is kind of your life. You kind of snuck that in there somewhere, uh, E.D. Do you want to tell me about how that worked in <laughs> So well, everything we read in this book is kind of like we're finding out about you, I guess. Yes, yes, you're finding to some out. Extent. What you're finding out is exactly how I grew up, the environment, the racial relations, the relationship I had with my siblings and, and my uh, grandparents, the relationship my grandparents had with each other. But my grandmother and I were uh, soulmates. We could talk to each other. Yeah. We could look into each other's eyes and yeah. talk. And there was a part of me that wanted to give her the world. So if she wanted to see one of hers get that freedom, as she called it, then I was going to give it to her. Yeah. And um, yeah, so but school this, was very important to me. This was a terrible time. This, this goes back to the 1960s, kind of where the book begins. And uh, there was a terrible time with race relations, mainly in the South. Yes the old Southern Confederacy, yes. who never really thought they lost the Civil War. They kept thinking they were going to have things their way. And talking about having things their way, I just got the halfway signal from Mary. I told you the show moves very quickly, <laughs> Edie, and it does. So we okay. gotta, we're halfway through. we got about 14 or 15 minutes to go before the show is over. I started, they, race relations were terrible, and in the 1950s, they thought they would try the approach of school integration. They thought if they could just bring a few black children into the white schools, that little by little, these different uh, races would begin to accept each other, and this would be a wonderful way to start this process of integration. It would be a long and laborious uh, process, but we've got to start somewhere, so let's try, let's try and teach the young children mm -hmm. through school and through the younger grades and bring them up slowly but surely, and this way we'll bring the races together. And it was a terrible time uh, down in Arkansas, for example, when they tried to bring those children into Central High School, mm -hmm. Little Rock. And the governor, uh, Faubus, came in and he brought the National Guard and he said, these children are not going to enter my white school. And President Eisenhower brought the, the army in and he said, yes, these children will mm -hmm. enter that Central High School in mm -hmm. Little Rock, Arkansas. So there's a terrible confrontation, and that's kind of the background Absolutely. of where the book begins and, and your life. And you grew up in that, that kind of environment when you were a small youngster. And maybe you want to, you want to, you want to talk a little bit about, about yeah, that? For, for me, and I will say that growing up in North Carolina, it, 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 was, it wasn't as vicious as in some other places. Yeah. But, uh, but I did not want to go to the all-white school. And it wasn't because I thought, because it was as vicious as in, in Mississippi and Arkansas. I had a, my own dream, and that was to go to school with my friends. So in this book, you do see the character try to find a way to get out of going to the all-white school. But in any case, she ends up there. And you, what, I, what I experienced is similar to what the character experienced. You had people who could care less what color someone was. But, the but they fear, were a minority. The majority had a problem with it, I guess. And I don't even know if I agree with that because yeah. I, I would say this. The minority ruled because they were the loudest and they were the angriest and they caused the most destruction because there were too many that I knew who could care less about my color, but the, but the fear of what would happen to them. Who wants to be excluded from, from the tea parties and the, and, and the clubs? As a black person growing up in the rural south, in the, uh, rural south on the farm, I knew nothing about tea parties, so I, they couldn't, that was no threat to me. Mm -hmm. But for those, for those whites, that was a fear to, of being excluded. And just like the character, you, de you, you dealt with becoming, I went from a school where I was the top. Full to, of black students, your friends. Right. Your to neighbors. a school yeah. where I was invisible. Yeah. 
And that was what I ha really had to deal with. You were one of just a very few, I guess, black students that were admitted to that all-white school. Kramer High School was the name of this. Is that a fictitious high school? That's fictitious. There's no real Kramer High School. No down Kramer there High in School. Wilson, North Carolina. No Kramer, and uh, not that I know of, because someone <laughs> might not. someone might say to me one day, "I went to Kramer," mm -hmm. but I I wasn't familiar with Kramer, mm -hmm. and there was no there wasn't a Snowden as the black high school. But I used those two schools to show that one was all black, one was all white. And then came that day when Brown versus Board of Education made integration real, but very- The law of the land. The law of the land, but very slowly for small groups of black children yeah. at a time. I always wondered why was it that way. These small little groups of black children being sent to the all-white school. And I, to this day, never believed that that made me any smarter. Now, the main character in your book, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, called Stay the Course, title of the book we've been putting uh, covers, uh, pictures of the cover of the book up on your TV screen at home or at your office, so you can see what the cover looks like. And our guest for tonight's program is sitting right alongside me. She wrote this wonderful, magnificent, beautiful book. And I, I emphasize the word beautiful. E.D. Arrington is her name from Wilson, North Carolina. Yes. We're talking about the history of what was going on back in the 50s and 60s when there was a terrible time of trying to integrate the races, the white and the blacks and so forth, and all the terrible things that went on. Eventually, it turned out uh, for the best. It turned out to, to be something that was accomplished took a lot of time, it took a lot of years, and, uh, but uh, the main character in your book, uh, E.D., is Laurie, who I have a sneaking suspicion and might be a little of something about you because it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a little bit of an autobiography, sort of, and Laurie is the main character. He's a little black girl, has been integrated into this white high school, and there's another girl who, the first day at school, this young lady, uh, when, when Laurie's trying to enter her classroom, she puts out her big white arm <laughs> with her red hair and her eyes flashing and say, you're not going into this classroom, young lady. And uh, she, she had a name. Her name was Debbie. You and remember that name. You'll never forget that name because that's something that probably happened in your <laughs> real life. But this is this nasty character in the book. And, oh, I hated Debbie myself when you, when you described her and the way she was try to prevent you from going in your classroom. But you got in the classroom and eventually things worked out over a, a long period of time. And somehow or other, Debbie got hers. Somewhere along the way, she got socked in the eye one day and had to go to the dispensary. And Laurie was ejected from school because of that incident. But everybody banded behind you, got on your uh, side. Behind and what Laurie. Happened? And they got you they back. They banded behind Laurie. Behind Laurie. People love to call me. Not you, but Not Laurie. me, but Laurie. Okay. Um, De Debbie Pennington, though, let me just say, was a bully. But she was, she was taught to, be, that to be a bully because she came from the upper class. And, but when she got, she did not. And, and this is the, the lesson that I really want children to understand is that Debbie Pennington, Lori should have been uh, uh, suspended from school because she touched, she struck someone. The problem was that Debbie Pennington didn't, got no punishment, and that's where the problem came in. And so the people banded behind Lori, not because she shouldn't have been, uh, she should have been suspended. They expelled her. She would not have made her ninth grade. They banded behind her, they got her into school, she was still had to be humiliated because of all she had to do to get back apologize into school. To everybody. Oh, everybody she had to and apologize. Especially Debbie. Especially Debbie. Oh, that, that, was, that, must have, that must have been a terrible experience. That was stinging. Talk about pride. Lowering your pride, she your self-esteem. She had to dismiss. But you know, her grandmother said to her, is it worth it to you? And there comes Ma back into the picture again, your grandma. Well, the grandma Ma in the, in the book, uh, Stay the Course, and uh, she said, no, you can do this. You can apologize. 
you can stay, but you can get back in that school again. You can become educated, graduate, and be an honor student, and go on with the rest. Of you. you stay in that school, and you apologize, even though you didn't, or Lori didn't want to do it. That was a real, a real conflict. But thank God for Ma, for Grandma. But one of the I loved Grandma. Yeah, everybody loves Ma, <laughs> but because Ma did give her the option, Ma asked her, "Is it worth it to you?" And Lori said. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'll do whatever they tell me. Because that was do. her mom. Because she wanted yeah. more than anything yeah. to see that for her her mom's lifelong dream to see one of her own get the freedom, and if that meant having to swallow all of her pride and apologize to everyone who had wronged her, she was willing to. Did she had to it? apologize to the class. She had to apologize to the student body. She had to apologize to the principal, the teacher, and especially to Debbie Pennington, yes. which was really something for her to yes. do. But she did it because Ma, Grandma, said to her and looked in her eyes and said, Stay the, the course. course. And that's the title of your book. Stay the Course. Terrific book. What, what a way to bring the is, title in, in, in of the quitting book. Quitting is not an option. Yeah. Now, one thing I liked a lot about the book, uh, E.D., is that some of the, the dialect that you used in there, so what I would like you to do, if you would, be kind enough, and you and I talked about this before the show, is open up to a page in the book, and to make the book as realistic and as authentic as it is, she uses the dialect of the folks down in uh, the area of Wilson, North Carolina, where this book kind of takes place, and we would like to have E.D. read a paragraph or so, sure. short paragraph, and in the in the dialect, in the accent, if you would, uh, Ed, to give you a real flavor of what this book is all about and how realistic it is. Sure, this was around the time when Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated, and Ma only had a third grade education. She told stories to explain or try to get her, to to get her two children at the time because two were gone, and she wanted to to teach them lessons, life lessons. And she, as, the, as they were watching Dr. Martin Luther King, she realized that one of the, that the, her oldest granddaughter wasn't just angry. She was beginning to exhibit hate. And then Ma's family, you didn't hate and you didn't hit. So she, when she noticed that hate in Jeanette, Ma stared Jeanette in the silence. Being angry ain't nothing to be ashamed of, sure ain't. As long as you live and you bound to feel it from time to time. I'm feeling quite smart of it right now myself. But hate, now that's something else. That's when you don't let your anger get way out of control. Instead of you ruling it, it's ruling you. Just like that man who killed Reverend King, he killed out of hate. Am I right, Tom? See, hate makes folks act foolish, do foolish things they sorry about later. Thing about it is you can't change what you've done after you've done done it. Sure can't. All this hating folks on the kind of who the mama is or who the mama ain't is nothing but a book. Foolishness. I felt when I read that mm -hmm. book, your book, uh, E.D., I felt like I was down there in Wilson, North Carolina, in the, in the time that you're talking about back in the 60s, when the ma was uh, talking, and you ain't going to get it. You've got to go down. And you used the vernacular, you used the dialect, and I felt I was right, right there where all this stuff happened. I'm telling you, it's fantastic. Where can we get, oh, folks, let me also mention at this point, uh, E.D. Arrington's website, where you can get some terrific information. She's written a couple of other books, and she has another new book that will be coming out uh, shortly. And uh, her website is, w we've been putting that up at the bottom of your screen, too, by the way, periodically during the course of the show, www.hernameedarringtonbooks.com is her website, where you can get a lot of tremendous information about this book, Stay the Course, and about all the other stuff that she's written as well, and the other books that will be coming out soon. What? What is the title of that new? I think I read that somewhere, the title of the new book coming, which is going to be a sequel Forever. to this. Forever oh. was 
a day. Forever was a day. And a little information on that be Forever on your website? Forever was on my website. Okay, folks, you got the website. And again, it's going to be on your TV screen at the bottom of your screen as we're doing our show. Where can we get the book, E.D.? I know Amazon.com, I guess, and where else? Amazon.com. Uh, all of those who have the Kindle, uh, can, the Nuke, uh, you just you can go right in and type in Stay the Course by E.D. Arrington. It'll come right up. Uh, you can go to AuthorHouse.com, who is the publisher of the book. Uh, but if you go to my website, www.edarringtonbooks.com, all of the information is right there. E.D., I just got the one-minute warning. we got to close the show. We're getting down to the end of our program. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. For coming up on that long, laborious Amtrak from Wilson, North Carolina, to come up here and see us. I know you're going to go to Baltimore to visit family over there when you leave here, and then back home to Wilson uh, when your trip is over. Thank you so much for coming up and seeing us. You're a wonderful guest. You're a magnificent writer. You're a beautiful writer. You wrote a fantastic book. I loved it, mm -hmm. and I wish you the best of success with Stay the Course, ladies and gentlemen, is the name of this wonderful book. And again, we've been putting pictures of it up on your TV screen periodically during the course of our program. We always go out by saying, keep on communicating for success and come back and see us again next week. Until then, bye-bye. Thank you. My goodness, my goodness. <laughs> a wonderful job. Oh, my day. goodness. Yeah, let's hold the book up and we'll take a little pose here. There we are.